Okay, well, let's get started. Um, welcome, everyone. From time to time, we like to, to showcase Glue's authentication partners, and Pluralock has done a really nice job integrating their authentication technology with Glue. So I don't want to give away anything that they're going to present right here. So I think I should just um, introduce Paul Baker, who's the director of sales from Plum Plurry Lock. And Paul, why don't you take it away? Thanks, Mike. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Paul Baker. I, I head up uh, sales operations here at Pluralock. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you today about, uh, about biometrics and glue and, and some of the, the cool things that we're doing here at Pluralock around that space. So as I'm sure you know, uh, glue gives you a, a really flexible and powerful identity platform that's, that's built on common authentication and, and web standards, standards that allows it to be easily uh, incorporated into multiple different applications and systems. And this coupled with things like single sign-on capabilities means it's, it's easier than ever for administrators and users to take advantage of, of digital identity. Um, but identity today is, is difficult. And unfortunately, some, uh, some past guidance has meant that um, the whole username and password thing can be difficult for users. And while the supercomputer in our, in our head is amazing at many things, it really wasn't designed to be able to remember illogical and, and meaningless things such as multiple complex passwords. And this is a, a significant reason as to why we see these kinds of stats around, around identity. And they're pretty frightening, um, but really they're not that surprising either. Uh, more than four out of five of, of every breach is down to some kind of identity compromise, um, be that an easily guessed password or a password that's been stolen and is being used in stuffing attacks uh, or common passwords that are used in spraying attacks or simply people not changing or, or sometimes not being able to change default passwords on devices. Now, because these password complexity rules are, are complex, um, users perform risky behaviors such as reusing passwords across uh, accounts. And a stolen complex password is, of course, no more secure than, than any other password. Uh, and you can pretty much guarantee, unfortunately, that, that all of your users are, are going to be reusing passwords. And that's either between different corporate applications or between personal and, uh, and work applications. And of course, the bad guys never rest. Uh, I'm sure you get daily attempts to get you to log into sites or open attachments from apparently valid addresses. Uh, and there are billions of attempted fraudulent logins every single year. Uh, and if we think to some of the recent breaches in, in financial institutions, it's unfortunate, but it happens. Um, you know, Capital One last year was a, was a former software engineer who, who had some insider threat info. Um, First American last year as well, which exposed over 880 million files that required no authentication at all to read them. Um, Better Sure out of South Africa last year had, uh, had an employee fished and then suffered a huge breach because of that. Um, and there were multiple US credit unions had similar kind of spear phishing attacks last year. And then there's simply in BMO and so on. Uh, and each breach of, um, of, of these sorts, really, regardless of the nature of them, uh, makes it much more likely that a credential-based attack is going to occur in, in future. And worryingly, because of things like password reuse, um, theft or breaches of, of any site can mean that your users are compromised, even though you were never directly breached. So to try and compensate for this and to add a layer of security that doesn't just rely on the performance limitations of, a, of the complex blob of, of sales water and squishy stuff, uh, organizations, organizations need to use additional security on, on top. And typically this comes in some form of multi-factor authentication or MFA. And it's been proven to help immensely with, with these credential type of attacks. And yet only 11% of all enterprise accounts are actually protected with an MFA. Uh, and I want to try and dig into that a little bit further as to see why, why that's the case. So typically when we, when we think about securing our users, we, we first think about our high risk users, um, traders, managers, human resources, system administrators, people like that. But really we need to, we need to recognize that, that all users pose risk. Um, often it's our low risk users who are the gateway to attacks. And yet they're usually the last users that we protect. Um, you know, Tim, the admin assistant has the same password for his Facebook account as his, as his internal work accounts. Facebook gets breached and now the attacker has a breach hidden into your system uh, and they can use that to land and expand their present. They can escalate, es escalate through more and more privileged users until they get what they want. Or, of course, they could just go straight ahead and, and plant some ransomware onto your system, which is always a fun one to deal with. And the nightmare scenario, of course, is, is that you have a high risk user uh, who's not aware of or, or more typically just doesn't practice good cyber hygiene. They can make it really, really easy for an attacker. So given that MFA solves for many attack avenues has been proven to massively reduce the chances of a successful identity based breach. Uh, why is it only 11%? Why is it only 11% of these enterprise accounts that get protected by it? 
and, and that's typically because of the hurdles in doing so. Um, there are many, many hurdles to, to implementing an MFA and it can be costly in more ways than one. Um, falling productivity, users being frustrated by, by the number of different steps they need to perform, and obviously increasing help desk tickets as well can really plague organizations who, who implement clunky MFA systems. Uh, and if you place barriers in the user's way, then, then the users can be surprisingly inventive about getting around those barriers, and that can often cause even bigger security problems than, than just their credentials did. You know, I'm sure we've all experienced or, or heard of users leaving USB authenticator fobs plugged into machines for convenience, uh, or even calling across the office to get someone to read out a code from an SMS so that they can share a login to, uh, to a SaaS application. So really what you need is, is some way of adding protection across all of your users without impacting their ability to just, to just get on with their day, without them being frustrated by authentication, and of course without overloading your, your authentication teams uh, and support teams. And one way that we can, we can solve that problem and make MFA easier is by using biometrics. And usually when people refer to biometrics, they're referring to, to static biometrics, scans of faces, retinas, fingerprints, that kind of thing. Uh, and the great benefit of those, of course, is it's very difficult to leave your finger at home. Uh, and often the devices themselves are, are pretty easy to use if they can be a little frustrating sometimes. But there are also many downsides of these types of authentications. Uh, privacy is a big one. If a static biometric measure is stolen, then it can be impossible to change. You know, there's been cases where biometric systems have been defeated by, by getting a fingerprint from high resolution photographs and actually creating a fake finger. There was one a while back that used, uh, used the same stuff they make gummy bears out of. Um, and obviously you only have, uh, have nine changes before you're taking off your shoes and socks to try and authenticate into your systems, which is, which is obviously not ideal. Uh, there's also then more hardware to deploy, you know, as we saw in the first rush to, to the work from home environment, specific hardware can be very expensive to acquire, distribute, and then of course you have to support it in the long term as well. Uh, and then with some of the, the phone based solutions out there, really you're just handing off that authentication of your users and relying on the security of a, of a specific device, be that a fingerprint reader on a Samsung phone or face ID on an Apple, or sometimes even just the user having a pin to protect their phone, which is, which is really just an even, an even lower entropy password. So here at Pluralock, we try and do things a bit, a bit differently. Uh, we, we want to provide solutions that are invisible unless there's something wrong. Uh, with nothing to carry, nothing to lose, and really nothing to do for the user. Um, so we created an MFA that uses behavioral biometrics. Uh, what do we mean by behavioral biometrics? Well, at a high level, it, it measures how a user behaves over time, um, typically through an interaction with their workstation. So when it comes to authenticating a user, for example, the way that that user types is very unique to them. The tiny micro patterns and speeds in which they move between keys, uh, how long they hold keys down for and so on, is a really effective fingerprint of that person. Uh, it's a combination of, of, of multiple physical factors, the length of their fingers, how their wrists work, the, the ways their muscles and tendons and, set, and so on are, uh, are set up. So we use these behavioral biometrics to, to authenticate users. Um, and, and when you get the power of, of glue and you add in Pluralox behavioral biometric solutions, you really get um, better authentication and it's all powered by machine learning in the back end. And, and I'm sure we'll talk about that uh, during questions. And really it's all about making sure that the, that the right person is accessing accounts in the right context. So the behavioral biometrics of the user confirms that, that not only is it actually a human sat there and not some kind of bot or script, but it's the right human that you expect to be using those credentials. Uh, and then we can overlay that with other, other signals. So we look at environmental data. We can look at your location and your location velocity. Are you somewhere where we expect you to be? And could you have physically got to that location given where we saw you last time? Uh, we look at other factors such as device fingerprinting, IP addressing, and so on. And that allows us to confirm the electronic and network contents of those users as well. And all of these different factors can then be combined together to give you really strong multi-multi-factor authentication protection for your users without the user really having to do anything. Um, behavior biometrics are also very privacy friendly because we're just looking at the timing patterns of how you, how you type a specific credential. There's nothing really that ties that biometric to you as an individual. Uh, it's just how you type that credential. Uh, we don't even know what the credential is. So should your profile somehow get, uh, get compromised by simply changing your password, any biometric that we had for you is now, is now completely irrelevant. It can't be used to, to generate an attack. It can't be traced back to you. And obviously it's much easier to change a password than it is to change your fingerprints. So um, 
in terms of where it sits in the in the whole glue ecosystem, uh, this example here shows the glue and Pluralock connected together to a, an Azure AD domain service, and that's actually synced to a, an on-premise Active Directory as well. Uh, and this is how the demo that I'm going to show you shortly is is hooked together. Uh, but really, we can support whatever Glue supports in terms of identity providers and, and stores and services and so on. So it's very, very easy to plug into your into your ecosystem. And then the um, the overall process is pretty straightforward. So the user logs in using their Glue identity, and our plugin sits in that authentication page and measures the the biometric and contextual factors. And then once the credential itself is validated. Um, the data gets passed to our ADAPT service, and, and that confirms the validity of the user's biometric and, and contextual data. And if everything looks good, the user is authenticated and they're into their application with no additional steps needed. They just, they just logged in. Uh, if there's some risk, i.e. we see something wrong about how that user is logging in, then the user can be directed to, uh, to a more traditional step up authentication process. We have our own mobile push application that you can use, or if you already have an existing MFA that you want to leverage, you can actually fall back to using that um, in, those, in those situations where the user was not able to be, to be authenticated invisibly. So I'm going to uh, go ahead and, and give you a, a demo of this now. Um, so I'm going to log into a Glue account that's protected by Pluralock. And as I mentioned, this is all hooked up in our, in our lab between Glue, uh, Active Directory, Azure AD, and Pluralock. So there's quite a few moving pieces in here. So let's go ahead and, uh, and show you this. Okay, so we've got a standard glue login page here, and this has got the Pluralock Adapt plugin installed into it. And that Adapt plugin is going to measure the way that I enter my credentials, and then it's going to also provide the contextual data from my uh, from my machine, and pass that off to the server for analysis, assuming that my credentials are correct. So if I go ahead and log in here. you'll see that we've just logged straight into the, um, the Glue dashboard here. So if I go ahead and log this out now, and this time I'm gonna repeat the process, but I'm just gonna type with two fingers and that's gonna simulate a change in my behavior. Uh, I could get someone else to come and sit here, but obviously with the, the current things, I can't do that. So I'm gonna log in here just with that uh, with two fingers. So this time, even though the credentials haven't changed, you'll see that I've been prompted for a step up. So I would now need to, to reach out to my phone and have a typical push kind of notification um, MFA experience. But most of the time, I just log in with my credentials. I behave normally, and it just lets me in invisibly with no additional steps, but still protecting that login by using uh, an MFA. So, um, so obviously that was that was recorded because we we don't need any demo fun and games. But all that magic is is surprisingly simple to um, to get. Really, it's three steps and you're good to go. Uh, you copy the files into your Glue server. There's a bit of configuration that you do around around setting up the authentication scripts and default authentication methods, and and you're good to go. You're protected by our behavioral MFA solution. And then from the end user's perspective, they just log in as normal and, and we look after the rest. Uh, if we need to to step up for some reason then the user can be directed to their appropriate app store. They can install the, the mobile authenticator app, go through the self-registration process and so on. Uh, or as I mentioned earlier, we can hook up to an existing MFA if you already have one in your stack that, uh, that you'd maybe like to, to use a little bit less. You know, if you want to look at um, hardware-based tokens and, and just make them less annoying, this is a great way of just reducing the reliance on those. And then a little about a little bit about um, about Pluralock. So as well as the adapt solution that we've looked at today, uh, we also have the ability to to continuously and invisibly authenticate your users all day long using their keyboard and, and mouse for behavioral biometrics. Uh, we authenticate these users in the background based on how they're interacting with their workstations every few seconds, and it's really a unique offering in the market. Um, Defend really fills those gaps in authentication that exist today, particularly as a, as a compensating control for any remote users where you don't really know who could be operating a computer in a home office, for example. I mean, I imagine being, being able to confidently know that, that that user really is that user and that they have been that user all day long. 
So this can really help you if you're looking to do things like zero trust environments. Um, and really what we can provide is, is the answer to the question, is this really you uh, all day long, which is, which is obviously a vital tool in this, in this new era. Um, and one of the things that you can look at is, is using Defend as well as a signal to power your SSO. So rather than just granting a user access based on some token on their machine, you can actually say, well, is, is this really the user before I go ahead and let them in? So lots of, uh, lots of kind of fun things you can do with, with those kinds of solutions as well. So just a quick summary of, of the things that we've looked at today. Um, obviously, risk is increasing. Everyone knows that. Um, there's more and more breaches that are exposing credentials all the time. Um, and unfortunately, users are often uh, helping, should we say, with their uh, with their cyber hygiene habits, and it's not their fault. It's just those things that happen. Um, and to at least address the some of those risks, you really should be adding some kind of MFA to your employee accounts to prevent at least most of those credential based attacks. Uh, but there are many challenges with MFA solutions today, friction, uh, frustration for your employees, just things that, that make it hard for them. And anytime you make it hard for your employee, well, it's, it's not going to work for them. Uh, so one potential solution here is, is that you can add glue and, and Pluralock um, together to give you stronger frictionless MFA that's all powered by our uh, behavioral biometrics. And that's, uh, that's all I have in terms of slides. Um, happy, to, uh, happy to look at questions. Yeah, so we can take some questions. I had some questions um, just off the bat. Um, how long does it take to get a good enrollment? How many times would the user have to en enter their password before you have a good mm -hmm. template? Yep. So we use we use ten samples to enroll a user. Um, so for the first ten times they log in, you can do it in two ways. You can either do it actively where you where you reach out to their phone during that enrollment process to make sure it's them, or you can actually do it passively and, and just measure it ten times. Um, you get a better result, obviously, with doing it actively because you know for sure that you have that you have the users sat there. But yeah, it's it's ten samples to build that initial profile, and then on the eleventh you're going to be uh, authenticated biometrically. I see. And and does does that is there an active enrollment process where you go in and you type your password in ten times, or do you just set a threshold and say, well, we're not going to check the behavioral template for the first ten logins or something? It's it's really up to you. Um, what we what we want to do is we want to learn what what's normal for that user. Um, and if you go in there and you just type the password ten times in in quick succession, then then that's not typically how you type it, right? As you get to the tenth one, you're probably a lot a lot faster typing it a lot and a different cadence overall to to the first one that you did so we generally recommend that you do everything in in a in a real way so you just kind of organically let the user log in 10 times uh, to get a good sample of how they would typically log into that application yeah we have a question um from from the audience mm -hmm. um the question is uh, users sometimes use the browser or LastPass to store passwords and autofill would you have to disable the autofill feature um for um, for this to work yeah, you can. Um, I mean, a kind of worst case, then the users would just step up and you'd have a more traditional MFA experience for them. But really, a lot of these um, uh, password managers and browser caching and things like that are really to get around the problem that the passwords are difficult. And if you overlay a password with behavioral biometrics, then the credential itself becomes less important. So it doesn't necessarily need to be complex and it's the complex part that people have trouble with right remembering remembering where did they put the exclamation mark or the number two in a, in a particular password so if you if you are having a compensated control on your password complexity such as such as our solution you can actually relax those rules and you can make passwords easier for users so rather than having a you know a 10 digit complex password you could maybe have a 15 digit natural language password where the the way that the user types that becomes the way of, of validating that credential and not just the credential itself I see. Um, is there a certain length of password that helps? I imagine if you just have a two character password, it's probably hard to get much data. Um, are there certain guidelines on password length? Yeah, I mean, we, we recommend kind of 14 characters. Um, or up, obviously long, longer is stronger, uh, and, you know, both both for the behavioral piece and for the credential itself in terms of brute forcing them. Um, so yeah, 14 characters or so is, is a good place to, to start from. But as I said, because it doesn't need to be um, complex, uh, it's actually easier for the user to be able to type those kinds of phrases. I see. I just want to add, um, so this script um, will be available in the Glue GitHub, and we could um, include this in Glue 4.3 out of the box, so customers will already have the script um, re ready to go. And I imagine they'll have to put in some things like API key and secret, but I, I think that um, we could 
included as a as a sort of a good starting point. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's super super straightforward to get it up and running. Um, it's yeah. Yeah, we're uh, um, we're we're really excited to be working with with the folks at Glue. What what types of um, customers have you seen, um, or or sort of what's your target o- um, audience or market for adoption? We've we've been uh, we've been focused very much on on the the financial market, um, uh, but really anywhere where you've got particularly regulatory pressure saying that you know you must have MFA and you must have it across all users. Um, we find it's a really good fit there because most of these organizations have looked at existing MFA solutions out there and they've realized that, that they're just not going to work for them, right? They're either too complex to implement, um, they rely on, on the users doing too many steps, they're too annoying or they're too expensive to actually deploy and, and use. Um, so we've seen really good success, success in, in those kinds of areas. Um, you know, where, where it's, it's regulatory driven uh, and yet there's no simple way for them to solve those regulatory pressures. Right. Right. Well, I, I really like these kinds of technologies because you're not asking users to change their behavior most of the time. Um, and it's using um, um, sort of the context and, and um, you know, trying to do anomaly detection. And um, I, I think that's really um, interesting and um, really a good solution for, um, for a lot of different types of businesses. Um, especially for employees who are um, employee facing, let's say, rather than customer facing, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, any, any, any time you make things difficult for a user, then you cause a lot of pain right the way across the organization. Um, so anything you can do to make that whole authentication thing easier and, and yet more secure is, is a good thing to do. Right. And the deployment is also a big consideration. Um, I, I, I know people tend to say, well, users complain a lot about 2FA, but I find that actually one of the biggest challenges is how easy is it to deploy and the API mechanism, you know, offering into the SaaS really makes it pretty easy. So, um, so I think yep. that's really a big concern. Um, Okay, well, um, I don't see any more questions. So, um, Paul, anything uh, be- you want to add before we before we conclude? No, I just want to thank everyone that's uh, that's joined in. Um, you know, I hope you found how found what we talked about today interesting. Uh, and obviously, if you want to dig into it a little bit deeper, then then don't hesitate to reach out to me. Okay, and um, there's an FAQ on Pluralox uh, website, and we're going to send out a, a link to this recording and some other some other helpful links after this. So thank you for everyone who joined and have a great day. Thanks, Steve.